the next several weeks, um, continuity-wise, are just going to be really broken, um, just because of the way things are falling. Um, so this is the last time that you'll hear about repentance for a week or two. Um, but we're still there. And I just wanted to um, kind of clarify some of the things that I said last week, or try to, because I, let's just put it this way. I kind of made a big deal about some of the things that I feel like God has, is calling me to repent of. And for example, I kind of made a big deal of the fact that I took a nap. Now, to most people, that just sounds silly, and it's really, it, it is, okay? And that's kind of what I, what I wanted to say to you, is that I know um, that's kind of silly for most people. It wasn't for me, uh, just because of where God has me. Um, delivering it to you, speaking it to you, is partly just me obeying God. But I just want to kind of assure you also um, that what I'm trying to do here is, is model a repentance that can be practiced in anything. Small or great, one of the truths that we uncovered last week was that all sin opposes Jesus. And so all sin needs to be repented of. And so I just wanted to assure you that uh, I just, I, I, I kind of listened back in my head. I didn't watch myself again. Um, but I kind of listened back in my head and I thought, that's just, that's kind of, it's the equivalent of the guy in the, in the small group, you know, back when we used to have small groups in the church I was growing up in. And, you know, it got really deep and really heavy. And the guy would be like, well, sometimes I, you know, say heck, you know, or whatever. It was like, I, I don't want that impression, right? I want you to understand, though, that we're kind of putting the ball on the tee so that you can handle fastballs also. Um, I don't know if that makes sense or not, but um, I just wanted to, um, you know, uh, small or great, um, all sin opposes Jesus, so all sin requires repentance. Repentance, returning to the God, is the way back. It's not back to relationship. That's settled. That's solid. Um, but it's back in line with his ways. And so we talked about, um, you know, that passage from 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel, I forget which it was, but uh, you have done all this evil, now serve the Lord. Um, so repentance is a course correction. It's, it's going from unbelief to belief in some area of your life. And uh, so these are different ways that we've um, defined it. But it means that we line ourselves back up again with his ways. And we didn't quite make it all the way through Paul's story, but we had seen, and so we're going to finish. We had seen all sin opposes Jesus. We had seen that we often go out of our way to oppose Jesus. Like Paul traveled all over the place. And I told you that wherever we go, we sometimes carry garbage with us that should not be with us. And then what we got to was this point where Paul is on his way to Damascus and he sees a light from heaven. What a gracious, glorious thing that is. Do you understand? Maybe not. I'm going to try to help us understand this whole light from heaven idea because you and I could just keep walking in absolute ignorance. We could just keep walking in absolute things that are going to wreck our lives and destroy us. And we could just kind of go, I don't know what to do. We could be clueless. We could be left without any sort of witness, any sort of truth, any sort of something to turn back on or, or, or to turn to. But that's not how God works. Never. It's not how God works in the life of an unbeliever. It's not how God, certainly not how God works in the life of a believer. We have truth. We have something to turn to. So that is that light from heaven. And Jesus tells him, it's tough for you to kick against the goads. And again, we didn't talk about that a whole lot, but basically that means, well, I, if I did like this, every hand would go up, but we won't. How many of you have been walking along, doing something you know you shouldn't have done, and just thought, this is not me. This, is, this doesn't fit. I don't, I don't like this. I don't want this. I mean, like in the moment, maybe you're like, you feel justified or you feel good about it or whatever, but it doesn't take very long for a true believer to get on the other side and go, Ugh. it's because it's tough for you to kick against the goats. It's tough for you. The, the goats were the spikes that they put on the front of wagons so that the, the animal wouldn't kick back. Because every time it kicked back, it got spiked. No, no, move forward. That's what a goat was. Um, 
And then Paul says, you will be told what you must do. So think about it kind of like those old, um, I don't think that they're as popular anymore, but there was a, a book series called Eat This, Not That. It's kind of like that. You're walking along, you're doing whatever you're doing that is wrong, and Jesus comes along and says, no, no, not that, this. Turn away from that, turn to this. That's the light from heaven. It's the opportunity to turn away, turn toward. Um, and in Acts 26, 15, is where we're picking up his story again. You're going to see a very familiar question. Acts 26, 15, then I asked, who are you, Lord? Remember, repentance is, what are you going to trust about God? What are you going to do with your sin? If you look at Acts 22, 10, he asks, what shall I do, Lord? And that's not, I don't know, that is that same question that was asked on Pentecost. It's the same question that was asked um, in one form um, of the Ethiopian eunuch. It's the same question that Jesus answered many times where people said, what do we do? It's a desperation question. It's a, I recognize my sinfulness. I recognize that I am separated from you. What in the world can I do? It's Romans 7. The things that I want to do, I'm not doing. The things that I don't want to do, those are the things that I'm doing. Who is going to set me free? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ. Um, so that's Acts 26. Who are you, Lord? Acts 22. He's, it's the same story. He's just telling it slightly differently. Uh, what shall I do, Lord? And then um, still in Acts 22. Um, so you, we'll be in 26 mostly, but 22 is a very simple thing that uh, is here in verse 14. Then he said, this is Ananias speaking to Paul, Saul, um, when, you know, of course, uh, I'm, I'm assuming you know the story, but Saul is struck blind. He is uh, brought into the city. He is uh, a man named Ananias. Ananias is led to him, and this is what Ananias says. Um, the God of our ancestors has chosen you to know his will and to see the righteous one, and to hear words from his mouth. You will be his witness to all people of what you have seen and heard. And now, what are you waiting for? Get up, be baptized, wash your sins away, calling on his name. Just like we don't like to think about all sin as opposing Jesus, just like we don't like to think about several of these things that we're talking about, we do not like to think of the instructions that we find in Scripture which I only have my tablet today, but we do not like to think of the instructions that we have in Scripture as coming from the mouth of the righteous one. Wouldn't it be so much easier if you could kind of look at Scripture and think of it as encouragements, suggestions? Try this. It might work. No. These are the words of the righteous one. That changes everything. Um, that's the reason we're doing this. That's the reason we started with scriptural authority. It's the reason we talked about how all of the word of God is shaping and it's creative and it's meant to do something in our lives. That scriptural authority is the light from heaven. And that leads to the repentance that brings refreshing. It's a dumb example. I'm going to give you a lot of dumb examples over the next, I don't know how many weeks, because we have to get this. I, I've read scripture pretty well. I have, um, you know, cover to cover, as they used to say, and I've done it several times. And I've studied it, and I've preached for most of the books. Um, but here's the deal. If we definitively accidentally, like, like we're studying something, we go, I didn't see that there. If we definitively run into a verse that says that all men have to have facial hair, then if it's the righteous one saying that, then you're going to see a really, really pathetic attempt at a beard. Right? Like, I can't grow anything here. It's just holes. But if the righteous one says it, it changes everything. So when the righteous one says things about our speech, about our attitudes, about our mindsets, about our dress, 
about the way that we, um, you know, work. When the righteous one talks about how we are to meet as a church, when the righteous one talks about how to structure a church, when the righteous one talks about anything, it's time to listen. It, it would be unthinkable to oppose him if we actually believed it. If we truly believe scripture was the word of God, if you could truly see, you know, the throne of heaven and words coming from God's mouth that say, what? Um, if your enemy is hungry, give him something to eat. If your enemy is thirsty, give him something to drink. If we really believe that was the righteous one, it's not a suggestion. <laughs> it's not an encouragement. These are the words of the righteous one. And that makes all the difference. If we run up against a scripture that deals with anything, these are the words of the righteous one that we are graced to hear. It is light from heaven. If we turn, well, we'll get there. Um, Acts 26, 17. Back to 26. I think we stay in 26 from now on. Um, <clears throat> this is again, uh, this is Jesus' words to Paul, probably through Ananias. I will rescue you from your own people and from the Gentiles. I am sending them to you. Uh, I am sending you to them to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to God, so that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. We've said before, but repentance is one of the primary drivers of sanctification. Sanctification is that you know, improvement, that, that, that uh, uh, maturing in Christ. Um, repentance, turning back to God, and both in the ways that we've explored, is what makes sanctification work. <clears throat> Did you see and hear all the really powerful contrasts that Paul, uh, that Paul Saul says here in Acts? Turn them from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to God. That is repentance. You know, I got up here when we first started talking about it and how <clears throat> my whole life I've heard repentance as a turnaround. And so it doesn't make sense because if I'm going this direction, and oh, yep, I got to go this direction. And then I, yep, yep, and it just doesn't make sense. <clears throat> it kind of gets me disoriented. I think a part of what's at work here <clears throat> is it's a turn of focus. Most churches, most Christians, most teachers only have one side of this equation. If you hear a sermon on sin, if you listen to a teaching, if you read a book on sin, it is often only what I've heard termed sin management. Here's how to stay away from that. Here's how not to do that. Here's how to not step in that hole again. Here's six tips. Here's blah, 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 blah. The part that's missing, okay, turn away. Absolutely. But turn to. That's the part that's been missing. And at least it's been missing in my life for a very long time. And, I, and I'm learning it again because I learned it years ago and it's just coming back around. But it, turn away, turn to. You turn back to God. You may repent, repent and turn back to God over the same sin multiple times, of course. But every time you turn away, turn toward. That's where the refreshing comes from. That's where the phrase that I use, fighting, or sometimes I use stumbling toward obedience, that's where that comes from. Um, it's Romans 7. Every time you turn away from sin, you turn toward God. God. Acts 26, 19, Paul is still speaking. So then, King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the vision from heaven. First to those in Damascus, then to those in Jerusalem and all Judea. And then to the Gentiles, I preached that they should repent and turn to God and demonstrate their repentance by their deeds. 
we return to God by following his ways. Turn away, turn to. It's that turn to. Turn away from this lie, this deception, this thing that I think is going to make me happy. Turn to the one that does. Even if that turning to is kind of disappointing in some way. We listen to the words from the righteous one's mouth. One last quick thought back in Acts 26. It says, that is why some Jews seized me in the temple courts and tried to kill me. Because he was talking about uh, Jesus being raised from the dead. Uh, but God has helped me in this very day. So I stand here and testify to small and great alike. I say nothing beyond what the prophets and Moses said would happen. That the Messiah would suffer and as the first to rise from the dead would bring the message of light to his own people and to the Gentiles. At this point, Festus interrupted Paul's defense. You are out of your mind, Paul, he shouted. Your great learning is driving you insane. There is a, uh, I think, no, I know it. There's no reason to soften this. Real repentance, godly scriptural repentance, would look weird in most churches. I don't think I'm overstating that. Again, there's lots of places where you would hear, turn away from, turn away from, turn away from. But it's both. It's turn away from, turn to. Turn away from, line your life back up with. And, and that kind of commitment, that kind of humility, that kind of following, I'm afraid it would be really weird in many churches. And it's certainly weird to anyone else that's outside the church. Agrippa says, you're insane. <laughs> so it comes down to, are we going to follow the words of the righteous one? Are we going to repent and return? The times are refreshing they come. Or are we going to soften that somehow? Are we going to back away from that somehow? Are we going to not deal with it? Every time that we sin, that we oppose Jesus, there is an opportunity there to turn away, turn to. That's where this, uh, we, we closed with this verse last time, I believe. Paul says, I'm not, a, I'm not insane, most excellent Festus. What I'm saying is true and reasonable. The king is familiar with these things, and I can speak freely to him. I am convinced that none of this has escaped his notice because it was not done in a corner. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know you do. <laughs> I love Paul's boldness. Then Agrippa said to Paul, do you think that in such a short time you can persuade me to be a Christian? And Paul replied, short time or long, I pray to God that not only you, but all who are listening to me today may become what I am except for these chains. I asked Deanna um, how I was doing on this final one that I'll give you. Um, again, just in obedience to God. Uh, this may not sound like a big deal to you, but it was. It still is. Um, when my ears sounded like blown speakers, every voice sounded like blown speakers. And uh, again, I'm just going to read to you from my writing so that I don't pull any punches as I speak. My wife's voice is now a drone. But what I've realized that it has been for some time. There has been so much, too much noise in my life. We've spoken of this before. Continuous podcasts, music, scrolling, input, input, input. I've long said that I have too many tabs open, but mostly in jest, in that smirky, keeping busy kind of way. The things we say to justify our existence, not to actually acknowledge a problem 
or problems. Not in a danger, danger, Will Robinson kind of way. Only certain of you got that. <laughs> Not in a red alert, shields up kind of way. It is currently an effort, a loving, selfless, panic-inducing effort to listen to my wife. I have to focus. I have to put down whatever is in front of my eyes. I don't wear headphones anymore or listen to much of anything, but there was a time when I had to turn off or at least turn down the other voice in the room. I have to now. I have to, but now want to. Treat her as I always should have, with focus, with attention, with love that was deficient when I was filled and distracted by so much other what? What could be worth it? What was I thinking? I've confessed all of this to her. I've prayed. I've asked for and received forgiveness from her and from God. I've told her I don't want to make some grand gesture, some wild resolution promise. I just want her to recognize that I am different from this point forward. I never want to see a screen in my hand when she is talking. And I have given her permission to knock it out of my hand. Or maybe just call me out on it since phones and tablets are expensive. You know, the, the, the newest thing, um, she bought me these headphones or at, at Christmas. These are the best things ever. Because you put them on and you can still hear. I can, play, I can play music right now. I can play, oh, I can play background music while I preach. <laughs> that would be cool. Like the theme to Avengers going through my head while I'm speaking. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Point is, she doesn't know if I've got anything on or not. So I asked her recently, I said, how am I doing? How am I doing with my focus towards you? This is a turn back, or sorry, turn away from, turn to moment. Turn away from where your wife was a drone, turn toward her, number one, and turn toward, because it's the righteous one that tells me how to treat her. And the righteous one tells me it's not good to treat her with this droning thing. The righteous one tells me that it's good to focus on her, to look at her as often as I can when we're talking. So I asked her, how am I doing? And she said, you're doing better, except for when the headphones are in. She doesn't know that they're not on. <laughs> because they just, they're so comfortable, too, that I kind of forget that I have them on. Like, I've walked out of the house before with them on, and gotten in the car, and then the car doesn't know which Bluetooth to pick up. So I don't know what the answer to that is. I guess I'm going to have to start putting them back in their case so that she knows. But... I just wanted to give you several examples from my own life of turning away from and turning to. This is Acts 9.31, and we'll wrap it up. Move to the Lord's Supper, because that is a picture of turning away and turning to. Acts 9.31 ends this way. Then the church throughout Judea, Galilee, and Samaria enjoyed a time of peace and was strengthened. Living in the fear of the Lord and encouraged by the Holy Spirit, it increased in numbers. And we can't increase numbers. That's just, I mean, suppose there's techniques or strategies or whatever that maybe we could put into practice, blah, 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 blah. It's not about that. God increased the numbers. It's about living in the fear of the Lord and encouraged by the Holy Spirit. You know what living in the fear of the Lord is? When we run across the righteous one's words, we say yes, sir. Officer on deck. You know what the encouragement of the Holy Spirit is? Refreshing. It's all locked up in continual, ongoing repentance. Turn away, turn to. Turn away, turn to. It doesn't spin you in circles. It refocuses you 
where your attention should have been all along. See, this, this, all, all of that that I just read you is a picture of this. If I were to ask you if the voice of God is a drone, again, I'll bet a whole lot of hands go up. Doesn't have to be that way. Doesn't have to be that way. Father, I, um, I, I just ask that, um, I don't know what I'm asking. <laughs> I want it to make sense. I want us to live this. I want to be a weird church. I want to be a church of people that out in the fields of life are continually practicing turn away from, turn to. Turn away from false beauty and chase after real beauty. Turn away from lies and chase after truth. Turn away from deception and chase after your glory. I, I want all of us to be weird. I, I want it to be unusual that we do what we do. And my, my fear, my insecurity is that I haven't done nearly as good enough job to explain it as I should have. And that's why I struggle with my praying here. But this is spirit taught. This is spirit led. So my closing prayer actually is that you would just open us up. Um, give us that level of humility to where we're, we're willing to listen to you. Where we want to listen to you. Where when we are reading in scripture and we come across something that goes against what we're currently doing, we don't just bypass it, but we, we realize that your righteous words are giving us a light from heaven and we have this incredible opportunity to turn away, turn to. Help us live that way. We pray that in Jesus' name.